Welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidas, buenas tardes. I'm Flavia Belpoliti. I'm Associate Professor of Spanish at Texas uh, A&M and Commerce. And with Jocelyn Mainers, my colleague, who is also here connected, uh, we co-direct the Texas Coalition for Heritage Spanish here at Coral. Uh, we've been working together for about five years, and this webinar is part of our project to try to support and um, help with any initiative has to do with heritage Spanish. We work with teachers, with researchers, with the students, and our community keeps growing and we're very, very glad that this project is going to continue in the near future. And just this week, we have a very nice announcement to make. We're planning to have our next summer workshop on June 23rd, 24th, 2022, next year, uh, in person in Austin. And we're planning to have as well some uh, online components. So hopefully we will we'll be able to see each other in person again and resume our, our summer, summer meetings. So that's a great news. Please save the date and keep, uh, keep the information. We'll be posting new information every month next, next year. So try to stay tuned. And well, for today, I mean, it's really my pleasure to introduce Adrián. Uh, Adrián Bradenberg teaches high school Spanish in uh, Colorado, and she works with second language learners and heritage learners as well. She presents regularly at the state level and also national level conferences with her, uh, her work on topics related with uh, heritage language teaching and literacy in particular. She currently serves as a chair of the uh, Spanish for Heritage Learners Special Interest Group in Actful. And uh, Adrián is truly passionate about working with teachers and with the students of Heritage Spanish. And uh, she's committed to a lifelong work of recognizing and dismantling system of operations in herself, in her classroom, and in her community. And today she's going to uh, share with us her ideas for uh, high leverage strategies for teaching writing to heritage learners. So please, let's welcome her. And we're very happy to have Adrian with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to share my slides um, and I put the link to the slides in the chat so you should be able to find them there. Um, could I just, could someone nod for me that you can see the like brown book slides? Everyone see? my screen that I shared? Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Awesome. Everything is here. Um, great. Okay. great, great. Okay. Um, my contact information is here. Um, I'm pretty reachable on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle. Um, and my email address is there as well. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, and you are welcome to go ahead and put your questions in the chat as I share um, during, and then hopefully we'll have time for discussion and also um, a question answer, hopefully time at the very end. So um, let me get started. So just a little bit about me. I have been teaching heritage classes since 2013. I live about an hour north of Denver. I have two little boys. They are seven and eight right now. Um, I have a blog shared. You mentioned the actual SIG chair. Um, if you are interested in anything I shared today, feel free to check out my blog. And uh, my favorite professional learning development is Twitter. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, I wanted to just take a second and share, um, just kind of name some of my privileges. It's always kind of strange to walk into a space um, as a white woman and a non-Latina, non-Latinx person and talk about heritage teaching. So I just want to acknowledge that those are privileges, this, this is kind of my lens, this is how I come into this work, um, that I am cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied woman. I am a US citizen, and although I'm a Spanish speaker, English is my first language. Um, so that that is a lens that I continue to try to understand how that impacts my work, especially as I do PD for um, heritage teachers and, and what that might look like. Um, some other privileges that um, kind of affect my perspective of the world is growing up um, with a middle class family. I'm a financially independent adult. I am, I have postgraduate degrees. 
My parents are still married and I live and work in what most people would call a desirable city and school district. So I just like to just kind of name that and, and, and say out loud that those are things that I am aware of and working on and trying to understand the impact of that as I share with you today. And the other thing I'd like to share is a land acknowledgement. Again, I'm in Northern Colorado. So um, as we start this presentation, I want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral lands of the Arapaho, Ute, Sisters, and Oshiti Shakoween tribal nations. We recognize that many indigenous members of these and other nations reside here despite settler colonialism and white supremacy. I want to thank them for being ongoing good stewards of the land, and I want to commit to advocating for the sovereignty of these tribal nations and for indigenous teachers, students, members of our community. In our own work, um, I vow to both recognize and seek out their contributions, center and amplify their voices, and intentionally work against systems that seek to erase and exclude them in their histories. Um, and I just wanted to say, I'm going to be sharing in English. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I will speak more on that later if we have time, but um, I hope you can bear with me today. It's just faster for me to speak in English, and I was going to try to reach through as many of these strategies as I can for you. Um, so the goal is I'm going to spend hopefully about 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes sharing some of these ideas from my classroom. And like I said, we'll hopefully do a breakout room at the end and then um, have some time for questions at the end. Um, and I know you might have seen in the um, in the description, but I use the workshop model. So you're going to hear me respond or refer to that a lot. If you're not familiar with the workshop model, if you think about um, kind of like a lab class, like a PE class or an art class where you kind of gather around the teacher and the teacher shows you like a new technique, like this is how you throw free throws at basketball. And they kind of show you the steps and then you kind of go off to go practice and the teacher comes around to coach. It looks kind of like that. So, um, so what I'm sharing comes from a classroom structured around that. But like I said in the description, I think a lot of the things I'm gonna to share today are things that would work in any classroom. And in any structure, I think you can make them make them work for you. So I'm hopeful that you could take some with you. Um, so the first thing um, I'm going to talk about um, is teaching writing explicitly. So um, demystifying writing, having a specific point that you're teaching. So if you're going to teach your students how to write a story, you can't just be like, go write a story. You have to actually think about what makes a story good or what makes an informative text good or what makes an argument text good. You have to think about what are the things, the ingredients. And then the idea would be you would teach each of those ingredients separately. Each day you're gonna teach a different skill. So what you're seeing here, these are anchor charts from my classroom. The one on the left is personal narrative, um, I believe from my 10th grade heritage class. And the one on the right is from my 11th grade argument writing unit. But each line that you see on here represents a day in the classroom. So one day we would do just one of these bullet points. So I would literally say, today I'm going to teach you this. And I would show them how to do it in my own writing and then they would practice it. So instead of having just like um, a big nebulous writing assignment, um, the idea would be um, to sort of break it down into little into little pieces. So this is an example because it has several things, but pretend um, this day I was teaching how my students could um, could emphasize the big idea in their narrative piece. Don't just tell me a story. Tell me why the story matters. And I was giving them a strategy to do that. And the strategy was include a flashback of another time in your life where you learned that same lesson or that same thing. So if your story is about the importance of family, go put a flashback in there of another time when you remember that family was important. Okay, so I'm giving them explicit strategies. Um, and so um, a couple of things to think about. So if you want whatever you're going to teach, are you going to teach a poem? Are you going to have them write um, a personal narrative? Are you going to have them write an informative piece? Think about what they need and then teach each one of those things. And then in just a second, we're going to talk about this, but show them what those things look like in real writing. Show them what they look like in student writing and show them what they look like in your own writing. Um, so the trick to this is, so teach writing explicitly, but don't do it too much. <laughs> Limit your direct instruction time. So your students are probably a lot like mine where 
as soon as you like they have limited attention span. So um, they can't listen for that long. So that lap, that huddle, that time when I'm teaching you free throws, my max is like 10 or 15 minutes. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that 10 or 15 minutes, then I'm gonna let you go try it. Then I'm gonna change the structure. I'm gonna let you go try it and I'll check in with you in a little bit. So trying to really hone in on like, um, what do I really have to teach you? And how can I do that quickly and efficiently? So this, um, this is just a pie chart of what um, workshop kind of looks like. So in my classroom, it's not perfect. But in my classroom, first they read at the beginning of class. We have block, so long periods. But the idea is you have a mini lesson. That's that huddle, that, that explicit direct instruction time. And most of the class is spent writing. And while they're writing, I'm checking in with them. And then at the end, we do a share up. So teach writing explicitly, teach the skills, the pieces, the ingredients, teach each one separately, and then don't teach, um, don't hold them for too long in a large group instruction. Um, so think about what systems or structures you could put into place that you that would make it possible for you to do small doses of explicit literacy instruction. So that's, that's kind of the big thing. For me, that mini lesson has been really a game changer for me. Another thing, it's so, this seems so basic to me, but um, it has made all the difference. Model everything, 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 everything. And by model, I mean, do it with them, but also show them a completed example. And I couldn't believe how long it took me to produce what I was asking them to produce. So if I want you to produce a personal narrative that's an important moment in your life, and I want it to be about something more than just losing the soccer game, if I want it to be like why that day mattered to me, <laughs> what I learned about life that day, I had to write it first and it took forever. And it gave me a ton of sympathy for how the students felt when I was asking them to do it. So these are just some examples. Um, as the longer I do this, this one in the middle, that's my handwriting. So I would show them, okay, this is my first draft of my story. And I would just run copies. Um, you also could, you know, make digital, however you want to do it. But these other two are student examples that I thought were really good. Um, and I think I have a picture. Let's see. No. You also, as you read books, you can say, hey, I, this is a great example of you know, this strategy, like, look, there's a flashback. I want to show my kids that flashback so I can mark it and make a copy of it. And I can keep it to show kids. Um, when kids are like, what is it supposed to look like? I want them to see an example. I've never had a kid copy one of my examples, never, because they know that I just handed that out. And so um, the cool thing is when you're teaching students to become better writers, when you're not teaching like a cookie cutter essay, and all the essays look the same, when you're teaching, when you're really meeting the needs of the, of the student as a writer and not just producing cookie cutter writing, um, it's okay to give them an example of the exact same thing they have to produce because their writing will be different. Um, so this is an example in my 10th grade class, they did a character analysis and a theme analysis. Um, and the first thing they had to write was a, an analysis of the three little, of the third pig in the three little pigs. And we did it as a class, but they had to write their own. Well, here's mine. And, I, and you can see we hadn't done intros and conclusions yet. So those are pretty basic. But they're like, what does it look like? What should it look like? How long should it be? How much evidence should there be? So it's just, I think it's important to show them examples of what it should look like. Um, the other thing is, if you're going to teach them to try something, for example, this is a strategy I wanted them to try. So. Um, I was trying to give them strategies to think of ideas for their personal narratives, because that's usually very hard for students. You say, think about an important time in your life. They're like, I don't have any important times in my life. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, instead, think of an important person in your life, and then think of some times you spent with that person. Okay, so what did I do? I shared with them my example. Here's mine. I'm thinking of my son. And the times I'm thinking of him was the day he got out of the NICU and we watched the Super Bowl at a friend's house. You know, I'm thinking, I'm do, I'm demoing it. And you can see it's in two colors because the green they copy down, but then the pencil is my writing and they're gonna do their own writing there, but I'm still modeling it. So lots of examples for them. 
So how many times have we have signed writing where we didn't have, we had, didn't have a final piece. <laughs> we didn't know how long it would take and we didn't appreciate how hard it is. Um, where could you get published examples? If I wanna show you a poem, do I have examples of poems? If I wanna show you imagery, where can I get imagery? One recommendation is Common Lit. If you're familiar, there's Common Lit um, in Espanol. You actually, if you're looking for like a literary device, you can say, show me good examples of imagery and all the ones will pop up. It's kind of cool. But the other thing I've really learned is, am I a reader? Am I reading a bunch? Do I know, do I know what good writing looks like? And while I'm reading, can I pick out things from what I'm reading to use with my students? And is it stuff that's relevant to them that they would be interested in? And then the last question, um, who's writing am I amplifying as a mentor text? So, you know, I don't, I don't really want to show my kids Quixote as an example of <laughs> fantasy writing. You know, I want to show, or whatever, realistic fiction. You know, who's writing am I using? Who is the author? What is their background? Um, and what do they have in common with my kids? And how am I kind of um, not, how am I making access <laughs> to good writing for my kids? And how am I um, cultivating an appreciation for writing that is not just the classics? So some things to think about as you're I'm looking for examples. Okay, a couple more. Um, while they're writing, you write. And that's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. I'm practicing this with reading while they read at the beginning of class. If I read at the beginning of class, it seems to go better. Um, but it's really hard. It's really hard to sit there and, and write while they write. What has been really helpful this year, especially last year with the online classes, is I would write under the document camera. So they could just see me up there writing and they could see how much I was writing. Um, I do think it's important to actually share your writing, like read your writing. So if they're working on personal narrative, a personal story, I'm gonna have a finished personal story that I wrote to share with them and use as kind of the mentor text, the example. I'm also gonna be working on a new one. And so as I teach them stuff, I'm gonna show them my new mentor text. I'm gonna show them my new story that I'm working on and talk through them, talk through the strategy in my new piece. And what does that mean? If I'm teaching them to write a personal story, here I am sharing like really vulnerable personal moments of my own life. So um, for a while, that was, that was pretty scary. <laughs> this was a different strategy to think of important things in your life. And it was like draw a map of somewhere in your past and then write notes about small moments that happened. So this is my cul-de-sac growing up and I'm sharing with the students things that happened in my cul-de-sac growing up. And each of these represents a story. So I'm sharing the story and then writing a note as I demonstrate it, you know, and that's stuff that in an, with, before I started teaching this way, I wouldn't, that's um, a lot of, a lot more vulnerable than things that I used to share. So I do think if we're asking students to be vulnerable and think of themselves as writers and share their writing and a lot of their identity in that writing, that we want to be um, sharing that. Um, this is just another example of how I was um, giving examples from, from my life, like when I was in college and got accused of cheating on my organic chemistry final and how awful that felt, you know, and the students were like horrified, but I think, you know, when they see you as a person, they want to share some of their, they feel more comfortable sharing their stories with you. So things to think about, do you, if you want to teach writing, if you want your students to become writers, I think the first question for me was like, am I a writer? I'm a person who writes, <laughs> but am I a writer? And so, you know, it's the same with reading. If I want my students to be readers, am I a reader? And that was something I really had to work on in my life. And I think it's the same for writing. Um, how vulnerable am I allowing myself to be with them? And how can I model that stuff that I want them to have <laughs> in myself? So growth mindset, this is just my first draft. I know it's going to get better. How can I model the vulnerability? How can I mo model what stamina looks like? And, you know, how can I model things like writer's block? Like, how can I, you know, well, I got stuck or I thought about this, but I wasn't sure how to, you know, how to go forward and then this is how I solved it or wasn't sure how to start the story. These were my two options and this is the one I thought I would pick. Um, and again, that, that consistent students always want to know kind of what it looks like. Okay, I think we're doing good on time. Okay, another recommendation would be give them a chance to try it out in a low 
risk situation. So if you're teaching writing, like for example, if I'm teaching them strategies to think about a story, like think about an important time in your life, I'm gonna give them the strategies and then I'm gonna let them share their strategies with their friends, share their ideas, their seed ideas, and pick one before they go write. Um, let's see, this is an example. I can't remember what, I don't know what they're sharing here. I don't remember, it's kind of an old picture, but you can see them when we get to the point where I'm asking them to start sharing their writing, um, sharing it with the least number of people is the safest for them. And so they're only sharing it with one person. The other thing that's less scary for them is just trading notebooks. It's very scary for them to hear their own voice reading their own writing. So before we could do that, we traded notebooks and just let the other person read. So you're just looking for ways for them to um, feel engaged without um, feeling like there's a, a, a lot tied to it. Um, so what structures do you have in place um, that allow students to try on the new ideas or practice the strategies in low stakes situations before they have to share out loud or before they're held accountable? A lot of times my students are writing stories and I tell them, I'm not gonna read any of them. I'm just checking that you wrote something. And then when I do start to read them, I say, which one do you want me to read? So I'm giving them lots of choice and voice in how that information is shared. I'm giving them a concrete way to start. I can't just say, write a story about an important time in your life. I have to give them some of those, those strategies. And that's why, I, this is the same screenshot, but I wanted to remember just the idea of teaching them like when you're stuck, what can you do? What can you do? Um, showing them you know the concrete breaking down the writing assignment into different parts you know and I, that's not rocket science but um that has really changed the game for me so here are some other ideas let's see the, the narrative ideas um there is something from i believe it's called right beside them the book right beside them um, where she does a quick write and so she shows um some sort of video or like a poetry slam, something engaging, like a hook for students and has them react to it for five minutes. So they write it, it's called a quick write and it's stream of consciousness. So just write whatever comes to your mind. Don't let your pen stop moving, write for five minutes. After they're done, they revise for two minutes. So she says, take a different color pen and revise your quick write for two minutes. Where could you change a word? Where would you like to add something? Where would you like to take something out? And then she would have them share. So giving them just concrete directions. Um, let's see. This is a little bit more confusing. But if you say today, you need to pick from these three options. Like today, you can revise your introduction to follow what we talked about. Today, you can go back and work on your analysis after every quote. Or today, you can um, listen for, for example, inconsistent um, narration which one is your plan? So giving them kind of a menu and saying, which is your plan? Writers make their own plan on how they get better. So pick your plan, tell your partner your plan, and then go do it. The other one that's really fun is um, if you have kids come up or like get to a side of the room for your huddle when you're going to demonstrate something, then you can say, okay, I want you to get started now. And once I see that you're ready, once I see that you've got a good start, I'm going to send you back to your seat. So you have the kids around you as they get going, you send them off back to their desk. And then at the end, you kind of have the stragglers that need a little more support. And you can either teach in, or you can say, why don't you just stay here with me and I'll make sure that we all get started together. Or you can coach kids individually. So it's kind of a, it's motivating for the students who maybe wouldn't <laughs> be working so quickly, but also it gives you a good feel for who really needs some extra support. This and I don't feel like a lot of these are rocket science, but they have made a world of difference in my class. Um, I used to teach writing for the sake of writing. I used to say, like, you need to learn how to do a five paragraph essay because that's what you're going to be expected to do. And I would like just pick random topics that I thought were interesting. I never gave students a chance to kind of share on what they would like to write about. And it showed they just produced, you know, bland cookie cutter writing. Um, so what you might think about is whatever kind of writing you're going to teach, um, think about how you could invite student voice and choice 
and center student interest in that. So I'm gonna go through each type of writing. Narrative writing is really easy <laughs> um, to, to get student buy-in. Um, the idea is that they they're gonna share their story their way. Um, but I think for me, the big thought was how are we gonna publish this? How are we gonna share this? And giving students um, some, some say <laughs> into like where it was gonna get published and for whom. Um, and for what? So we've, I've had this, this picture right here was like a party where I invited important adults to the students in the school to come see their writing. Um, and some students translate it. So like this teacher in French, she doesn't speak Spanish. I'll look at Spanish. <laughs> so um, he's translating his story into English for her because he wanted her to read his, her, his story. I've had kids publish for the literary magazine. Um, we have done, I wonder if I have another, no. Um, we have done like a medium, like a kind of like a website, class website, or published through a blog um, where all the students can post their stories. So thinking about how can I center student voice in argument writing? <laughs> how, can you, how, can you, how can you center student voice in ownership if you're doing literary essays? You know, I, there's a whole blog post I did on this, but you know, that you can see the student is working on a tool. I think a lot of independence was a big deal for them teaching them kind of the steps and letting them synthesize their own analysis. That was like a game changer. Instead of me saying, I need you to write a paper on blah, blah, blah. I let them come up with their, what they were gonna analyze. I also let them pick their stories. So we read several stories, some of them off the AP literature list and whatever made their brains like, what? I, you know, once they had ownership of the, of the story, they really wanted to um, kind of take a, take a stand. And again, persuasive, writing, you know, is it, an, is it a topic that they care about? And it, are we publishing it in a format that matters to them? I just started an information writing unit with my, so what are they, my 10th graders, and we're doing youth activism. So like what youth act, what topics on youth activism matter to you? Well, to a lot of my students, DACA matters. To a lot of my students, um, gun control stuff matters. So those are the activists that they want to focus on. So giving them a um, voice and choice. So thinking about how am I centering my students in the topic and content, like by the theme, and then also the format, genre, or context. How am I making that genre important to them? Why, why do they care? Um, and I'm looking for ways where they feel empowered, where they feel like they want to get better because they're proud of their work and they have the tools. They know where to go. They know where to go look at examples. They know how to make it better. They have the, uh, the knowledge. They know, like, I need to do this, this, and this. So where can I get the resources to do that? So working on um, um, making them advocates for their own learning and not all of it on me all the time. <laughs> I'm practicing volume and stamina. So if writing is important, if I think writing is important, then how much am I dedicating to actually writing in class? Like if you'd say, what's the most important things in my class? And then does how much time I spend on those line up? Um, in my old classes, that wasn't happening. You know, I'd say writing is important, but the way, the amount of time they were actually spending writing wasn't that much. Um, do I know what the research says about improving your writing skills? Um, what writing skills increase the achievement for most students? And in case you're not familiar, which I was not, if we give instruction in, ha in elaboration, which is kind of like, um, these are called like author's craft. So if you can teach students to elaborate in their writing and teach author's crafts, what moves is the author using? That is what pushes the needle for students. We know that's what moves them up grade levels in writing instruction. And so how can I spend most of my time doing those two things? I don't want to talk about spelling and accents. I don't want to talk about organization. I want to talk about elaboration and craft. And then what is my plan? So how much are my students going to write every day? My students write at least two pages a day every day all year. Um, and so they're writing, you know, am I going to assign homework? I don't assign homework. But if you assign homework and they write for homework, they will get better that much faster. Okay, follow a predictable routine. So it's much easier to find time for writing when you have a routine. So I'm not saying you need my routine. I'm just saying, you know, if writing is just one little unit that you do, um, what is the routine for the students? Is there a way you could build writing into like every week we do two days of writing or every Monday I have this or in every unit we do these three pieces. You know, what, what is a way where you could build in writing where your students know what to expect, where your students know, okay, I'm gonna get a dose of 
um, information and then I'm going to practice and she's going to check in with me and coach me. Um, so we make time for what we care about. So oh, I already shared this. How much time am I dedicated to writing? Right, we're almost done. Demystify writing by giving a step-by-step -step or a concrete strategy. So I was thinking about like when you give back a piece of writing and it's like a B and students are like, okay, I don't really know why it's a B. Like, why isn't it an A? And you know, it's gotten better with rubrics, but even with rubrics, I'd be like, okay, you have a hook, great. You know, and then what is the alternative? You try to hook is a B and then you don't have a hook is like a C. Like, I didn't really understand what a good hook meant. And so I had to kind of go, I had to get some resources and be like, okay, how can I teach you to do this better? What is, does it have a decent hook? What is a good hook? And, and that's empowering for students. So when I hand it back, when students know, like I have to do each of these things. So this, this is copyrighted, but this is just a screenshot to give you an idea. Um, on these rubrics, I believe this is narrative writing. Um, so this, what I said, elaboration and craft, author's craft, this is worth double. And the students know, so each day I'm teaching one of these. These are kind of like the same things as those checklists. So they know each day those have to get, um, each day we work on those and those are what they're working on putting in their paper. So if they know they have to do all that to get an A and today they got a B, they're gonna go to their rubric and they'll be like, yep, you're right. I'm still working on that bigger meaning. <laughs> like that's still my thing. Or, um, is there a flashback on here? Not yet. Okay. Or I'm still working on the internal story. So when you can tell students you're not quite there, but here is what you need to do to get there um, in terms of writing and not just putting something in, that's super empowering for students. Um, and, and feeling like we are responsible. If your students don't like writing, in many ways, it's similar to reading. If they don't like reading, it's my job to fix that. It's my job to repair the relationship between my students and writing and my students and school and academic spaces. So how am I doing that? How am I empowering my students? Okay, meeting with students. So again, in this, so I don't ever write anything on the writing. All I do is meet with them and talk about their writing. So they're in charge of noting stuff down. They're in charge of everything, but I do give feedback. It's just spoken feedback. But I'm able to do that because for 40 minutes or a huge block of time every day, I'm meeting with students. I call students up and we just go. When I get through the alphabet, I start again. <laughs> you could do small groups, you could do pairs. Um, it also helps to move around the room and give feedback because it, the kids around you, around the kid you're talking to are listening. So you get kind of like double bang for your buck. So what, um, the individual feedback is really important because we know that pushes the needle for students. So what structures can you put in place where you can still give the individualized feedback? Um, this is how I differentiate. This is how I push the students that are ready for more. And this is how I meet the students who are not quite hitting grade level standards. Um, and what kind of structures do I have in place so I don't get burned out? It's because I'm not reading all that writing, right? I'm only, when I sit with them, I say, which one do you want me to read and give you feedback on? So I'm not grading at all. Most of it is completion. Are you putting in the time? And then what, what, how am I giving students the, the tools they need so it's not all dependent on me? How am I teaching them to independently improve their writing? Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, the last one is published for real purposes. So this was that, this is an example of that blog that I explained. Um, and these are the realistic fiction pieces that were fantastic. This is last year for argument writing, my class, um, investigated the benefits of homework because my school was thinking about getting rid of it. And then they did a presentation for my admin. So my admin is actually um, celebrating their progress. So I won't bore you, but so that's kind of all I have to share as far as strategies that um, have worked for me. So I thought what we would do is um, just, I know that was a lot of me talking, but I thought I'd give you at least 10 minutes, maybe 15. Um, and I was going to put you in breakout rooms and give you some time to just digest. What did you hear? What did you like? What do you have questions about? Um, and I'm not sure we'll have time to share out because um, I'm anticipating a lot of groups. So what I thought was there's a note catcher here. Um, I'll drop it in the chat if you don't have it open. But if someone in your group could just record kind of what you talked about, then the other people in the other groups can come back and see. Also, it'd be good feedback for me <laughs> um, to see it. So if someone um, could set up some breakout rooms, maybe like 10-ish breakout rooms, and the questions are at the top of these. Let's see.
I'm going to drop the, so there's the breakout um, or the documents so if everyone just wants to head over there. So the top just has some of the questions and then whatever breakout room you're in, if you just want to put the first names of whoever was there and then whatever you kind of talk about. And then I'll see you back here in about 10-ish minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Does that sound good? Okay. Gosh, so sorry, friends, if you got pulled out and you were still <laughs> in mid-conversation. Gosh, it's so nice to just hear other people's experiences and stories. Um, if you're still on that, the, I'll drop it in the chat again, the um, collaborative document, you might just scroll down and see kind of what some of the other groups talked about. I'll put it in the chat real quick. Um, but we had kind of left a few minutes here at the end. Any pressing, um, sorry, put, uh, pressing questions. And so it didn't seem like there were any questions in the chat. So I, if you want to unmute and ask a question or just put your question in the chat, um, we can take a few minutes and um, anything you really <laughs> want to ask about or are curious about. Yeah, so Melinda has in the chat some titles or resources. It's funny, right as I was finishing this, I was like, oh crap, I forgot a whole resource slide. Um, so I can add that. I would, um, I use Heinemann's um, materials. So what you saw was from Teachers College at Columbia, um, their units of study um, for writing. I also use them for reading. But there's a book called Writing Pathways, which you can look up on um, Amazon. It's also for sale by Heinemann. Um, but you can get it for K, let's see, you can get it just for middle school. That's like it. I use it in high school. So I, I don't, I think that, I think the grade levels are misleading. You can just get the middle school one, which would be fine. If you have younger learners, they have a K-8 ones. Yep, it's Lucy Calkins. But they have the progression. So well, that's what's been really helpful for me. So you can look and say, okay, what are the ingredients of a good narrative writing at, you know, at the lower levels? And how does it progress to become a better piece of narrative writing? So that was some of the information that I didn't know. Like I wasn't doing English language acquisition, so I needed some help with that. Um, I don't think you have to buy the whole curriculum. I think if you could just look at that list of ingredients and say, yeah, I could teach my kids that. I can find good examples and I can show them how to do that. That'll give you a good place to start. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, so those, that's, um, I mean, basically you're looking for what makes a good informative piece a good informative piece. Like that, that's what you're looking for. And that has been the most helpful for me. Other questions, you can um, unmute or you can put it in the chat. <laughs> Opinion. And I was gonna look there, it looks like there were some questions on that, let me see. So Adriana, I have a question. Can you expand more in the sharing at the end of the class? Is that you pair them, they just choose a partner and they just breathe and... Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. I try to do it different every day. And actually what's worked better this year, I'm, I used to never do it. And then once I started doing it, I realized how powerful it was. And now I'm trying harder not to skip it. But actually what's been easier for me is when students finish the work of the day, I let them put it away and work on something else. But the next day when we come back and we meet in a circle and check in with everyone, we have our writing from yesterday. And so I'll do something to share. So if we're, it might say, pick your favorite line and read your favorite line, and we're going to go all the way around. It might be, um, read your introduction to your partner and see if your partner can guess what um, technique you used. You know, it could be different every day. It might be get with a partner and read them your whole story, but that would take forever. <laughs> so the idea is to um, foster community and also build um, buy-in that like they want to read what that student's writing and that they can learn from each other and not just from me. So, and then someone asked what my grade book looks like. Um, we do like formative summative if you if you're familiar. So most of our grade book it's like it's kind of like seventy five percent tests quote unquote, like important stuff. So that would be, and then 25% practice is what it looks like. And so all the daily stuff is goes into that little category, right? And it's usually completion. Like, did you do session one? Did you do session two? Did you do session three? But it builds up to a final piece. And the final piece would be in the big category. And then I usually balance the final piece with a test. 
So like you wrote, you, you worked on a narrative piece together, but you also have to write a new narrative in one sitting. It's the same rubric. And so can you transfer the skills to a new piece? And then those kind of balance each other out. And those go in the big category. And then the little category is just, are you here every day? Are you keeping up? Are you working on stuff? I don't actually, okay, thanks. <laughs> I was like, I don't actually know the answer to that question. It looks like the recording will be posted on the website and then also sent to you all soon. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to, I'm not sure who's closing, I don't have that open. <laughs> but thanks again for spending some time in community here tonight. It's really fun to be with you all and for having me and for being such a captive audience. And you might want to just take a look at the breakout room document and just see kind of what the other takeaways were. You might be encouraged by what the other groups kind of shared. So, oh, look at our little emojis. Those are so fun. <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much, Adrian. And I am posting here on the chat right now, the link to our website and specifically the page where we have video recordings and materials from previous webinars and uh, workshops. And that's where we will post this one when it's ready. But also Sarah just said, we're gonna send it out by email. So first of all, I wanna thank Adrienne again for sharing all her uh, strategies and useful tips for teaching writing. Thank you so much for preparing this for us and sharing with everyone. And also thank you everyone for coming today and joining us. I know it's after work and people are tired, but uh, it says a lot that you're here. I know we really care about our students and that's why we, why we do what we do, right? Entonces, muchas gracias a todos por venir y solo uno, algunos anuncios antes de irnos. Primero les queremos eh, pedir que por favor completen un survey que voy a poner aquí en el chat. Here's the link to the survey. And it would be, oh, Sarah just posted it as well. It'd be really helpful. Oh, and I think I didn't put, send this to everyone. So I'm here, I'm sending it again. It'd be really helpful for us if you fill out the survey and let us know what you thought of today and how we can improve. And also, uh, it's always great to hear about what other topics are you would be interested in. Um, ¿Qué más? Otros anuncios que tenía para hoy es que, bueno, intentamos hacer uno o dos de estos Hangouts webinars cada semestre, así que en, el, en la primavera esperamos tener mínimo uno, pero tal vez dos de estos Hangouts. So please make sure to look out for announcements and advertising for uh, at least one or maybe two more Hangouts. Y la noticia que nos dio Flavia al principio también es que escogimos una fecha para nuestro workshop del verano. Cada verano tenemos un workshop de dos días completos de eh, información eh, útil para instructores de Spanish as a Heritage Language. Y entonces normalmente lo hacemos aquí en Austin, Texas, en persona. Los últimos dos años ha sido virtual en línea por razones obvias. Pero eh, esperamos que este próximo junio 23 y 24 de junio estaremos en persona de nuevo en Austin. Si algo cambia, claro, les estaremos diciendo, pero nos da muchísima ilusión recibirlos a todos de nuevo aquí en Austin. Eh, creo que esos son todos mis anuncios. Eh, Flavia, no sé si querías agregar otra cosa. No, or Sarah, creo que no. No, I think that we cover everything for this session. And thank you, Adrian, again. It was a fantastic presentation. As always, we needed more time for a discussion. I mean, my group was really, really into it. But I mean, thank you for all the ideas. And we will keep keep talking about it. So thanks. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you for coming. Have a good evening. Gracias a todos.